Hi, Homeworthy. I'm Adnan. Welcome to my home in New York City. I can't wait to show you around. Hi, I'm Allison Kenworthy, the founder of Homeworthy, and we're now offering a membership plan that gives our supporters early and exclusive access to new videos. Hi, Homeworthy. I'm Roz. You're here at my home in Los Angeles? Come on in, I can't wait to show you around. With this membership, we invite you to open more doors, discovering new homes, rooms, and personalities available only to those with the keys to our guest house. You'll be part of a community of people who are just as passionate as you are about interior design. Before today's episode, click the join button below to support all of the storytelling we do on this channel. Our growing community of members help to directly fund more videos so we can capture these extraordinary homes from around the world. So join today to receive early and exclusive access to new Homeworthy videos. You're watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. Hi everyone, I'm Adnan Anwar, and we're in New York City at my apartment on the Upper East Side. So I was not supposed to live in this apartment. I had signed a lease on another apartment in the area that burned down the day I was moving in. I was on a plane with my stuff. I got a call when I'd already boarded from the super that there was a fire going on, he wasn't sure what was happening, and it was probably best if I turned around if I was in the car. And thankfully, not many of my things had been shipped there yet, so, and I was fine, which was great. Um, but after that, I was living at a friend's house, kind of figuring out what my next move would be, and this apartment was the first apartment I saw. And it honestly seemed too good to be true. I honestly, it was the first thing I saw that day, and I ended up seeing, I think, six more apartments that week before I finally pulled the trigger, and I knew this was the one. I loved the herringbone floors, I loved the light, I loved being only a block from Central Park, and I loved that it was an, a small building. We're in a townhouse building that was built in the late 19th century, and I have one floor of it. It's definitely a historic building. It has beautiful banisters in the hallway, and crown molding and interesting these you'll see almost hexagonal arches breaking things up but it was overlaid with a lot of landlord specials over the years that i tried to rectify otherwise they mostly did an okay job not a great bathroom renovation and i had to make some tweaks to the kitchen but overall good good bones i would say I think it's somewhere between, I haven't measured it, which is funny because I do this for a living, but I'm probably somewhere between six and 800 square feet. Welcome to my living room, which is the biggest room in my apartment and also where I definitely spend the most time. This apartment definitely had a proper fireplace or a decorative fireplace originally. And when I got the apartment, there was no mantle in it. So it was just this awkward dip. And I knew I wanted to add a mantle in because it felt most logical with the layout and as though it would create a focal point. I was just looking for the right one and I didn't have one, want to have one custom made because it is a rental apartment. I found out that the fireplace was actually salvaged from a Rockefeller estate that was being redone um, in Greenwich. And so I put the TV over it and it definitely presented a problem of the rare times when it is off, it can be kind of an eyesore. And I don't love the projecting art on TVs and I also can't figure it out. So what I ended up doing is getting a collection of film stills from various movies that I'm always adding to in black and white. So when I'm not watching the TV, that's on. So it's as though I have art above the fireplace, but because it's such a wide fireplace, I knew I needed something underneath it that wouldn't be painting it black, and ideally something reflective, um, kind of flipping the usual thing of having the mirror over the fireplace. And a proper mirror I thought would be a little too intense to stare at when I was sitting on the sofa. It would be uh, make me a little uneasy. So I found these 
mirrored reflective tiles on Amazon that I did in the stitched square format that reflect the room and also have this almost fun house, like antique mirror quality, which I love. And it, to fill the space underneath, I did a series of decorative boxes that I've been collecting over the years. I have more books than I know what to do with, and the con collection is constantly growing. Books about artists, books about that are sentimental, books that were gifts. And this apartment didn't really have a good spot for a bookshelf. So when you look around, you'll see basically every surface that can have books on it has little artistic book stacks on it. And this one has... And if I need extra seating, because I have a larger amount of people over, I'm able to take the books off, put them underneath, and then that adds extra seating, which is great. But another favorite thing is this little Cocker Spaniel, which I found at a thrift store that was raising money for stray cats in rural Pennsylvania on the most awful trip. And it was $4. And I loved it because it was the perfect doppelganger for Cody, who is my favorite English Cocker Spaniel best friend. And the first day it came in, it was the funniest thing because Cody was sniffing it and almost kissing it. So I think he recognized that it was the same kind of dog as he is. I definitely wanted a good reading nook in this apartment, kind of a hangout spot comfortable chair in ottoman and i ended up going really bold and doing one in my favorite color which is orange and having um this pillow from uzbekistan and those carolina irving pillow on it to kind of soften it up with this mid-century lamp that has this kind of trendy pleated shade on it that i thought kind of mimicked the bowl that i keep my marble collection in and above it, this wall has a lot of rectangles. It has rectangular art. It has the TV. It has the fireplace. But this space looked very strange being completely empty. And so the best solution ended up being a wall of plates, which is not something I do often. And these plates, most of them, are from a set called the Hybrid Series by Saletti. And I was so obsessed with the way they mixed Eastern and Western pottery traditions and these kind of spliced designs, but they're the kinds of plates that I wouldn't really want to eat on. I would never want to set a table with them, and they were just perfect for the wall, but there wasn't quite enough from the whole set to fill the area what I wanted. So I found this plate with, at, when I was at my friend Amy's wedding in Florida. It was just a one-off, a whole set wasn't available, which is great because a whole set of it would be a little too Beauty and the Beast for me to set a table with, but I just loved the playful French details. And that plate is from Francis Ford Coppola, and the one on the top is a very classic Blue Willow pattern, and it almost looks as though it could be spliced in half to make one of the plates from the Salati set. And you can see I have places for candlesticks everywhere, because when I do entertain, I think lighting candles is so wonderful. And I love these little matches also. They're too pretty to light almost, but a client gave these to me and I thought this was a nice way to display them, having them tucked in. When I set up the chair, having like a big thing of orange I felt was kind of overwhelming, a big block. So I ended up breaking it up with this embroidered shawl from my great grandma. And I love the way it adds softness and puts it in a place of honor versus sitting in a drawer. And I, I just, and it, because it's black, it feels so crisp and contemporary to me, even though it's very old. I'm always rotating out the book that I have in this spot, but Great. Um, I love this chair. It's definitely my favorite seating place in the apartment. One thing I would say about being in a smaller space is you need to really prioritize having your favorite things and the things that are most important to you to meet your lifestyle requirements, whether that is you work from home, if you like to have people over for dinner, and really build the layout around those occasions. So there's no substitute for having a really good floor plan when you get started of where things will go. Another thing that I love for storage is 
having skirted sofas because I think skirted sofas can often win you a little bit of space underneath and also under bed storage. This apartment, I was very lucky in that it honestly had more storage than I needed almost. It had three walk-in closets, which is a big reason why I took the apartment. I think what you see in my apartment is that I am a hunter for interesting things first and foremost and then find places to fit them in and build the room around those pieces and ways to display them, I would say. Now that we've gone through my kind of fireplace and the, my reading nook, this is the main seating area of the apartment that you see when you walk in. I ended up going with a white skirted slip covered sofa because of Cody, because it can go in the wash, but also because it allows me to be constantly rotating and show a really fun mix of pillows because I like all of these fabrics individually but they weren't something that I would have wanted to do a set of two in. I generally don't love things to be too matchy matchy I'd say and so this pillow with the dragon is from Daydar. This was a gift from my friend Lucy and it's an old Killam rug that was chopped up. This one's from Schumacher. This is a Nisha Crossland pillow, and this is a vintage sari from India that I think really grounds the room to have on the back of the sofa. And then this pillow is the same fabric as the reading chair to add some continuity to the space. And then the two side tables are both antique English, one's from the 1820s and one's from the 1840s, and just love the little inlay in them and how they give me a space to display some of my favorite objects. I found this in the trash actually and it's kind of this bedazzled old bottle that was just the prettiest thing. I was with a friend at the time who is very germaphobic and we were headed to his apartment. And so he actually made me leave it outside the door while we were hanging out, but I wasn't gonna leave it behind. I just thought it was the coolest thing. And I try to have a mix of crafty things and really modern objects. And these lamps are from Orifors from the um, 1950s by Carl Fagerland. And I ended up swapping in uh, this white linen that kind of got lost in the room and I don't think did them justice. And I love how the pink and the orange and the red tie together a lot of colors that are present throughout the apartment. This is a tortoise shell that I thought almost looks like art. I bought it from an antique dealer who was closing his doors, he was retiring, and I just loved it. And it was the perfect size. And when I do a gallery wall, I love to have some three-dimensional elements to give it some more interest um, than just a sea of flat things. And so the first things I hung were this textile, um, this really, it's really it's a painting on fabric that my mom gave me. I had this framed, I had that, and then the other three places pieces took a little more time. So for a good bit, this gallery wall was incomplete, but I loved how this piece almost looks like a blown up Indian miniature in a lot of ways, but it has cherubs in it and some things you don't usually see in art of that genre. And then this is a Hiroshi Sugimoto photograph. I spent a lot of time doing photography in high school, so you'll see a lot of that throughout the apartment. And then this is a collage by Mary Ellen Horty that uh, I love collage and decoupage, and it adds a nice mix of media. Here you get photography, you get um, photography from a very different era. This is from a series, a German photographer who went to Mexico in the 1920s did. And you see this incredible cactus uh, that is just out of this world. And the scale is so dwarfed by those little horses. Then I have this, I have that. And they're all from different time periods and they all have a very different soul. And so, but I think they go together well and they helped fill out the space because I wouldn't have wanted just this large piece over the sofa. Yeah, then here you'll see this is where Cody's bowl is. I'm always looking for little pretty china pieces that he can use to eat his food out of because I think most dog bowls are just butt ugly and drive me crazy. And I get them cheaply enough that if they break, I don't really care. And then there's another five waiting in the wings. It's honestly enables my hoarding and I'm very okay with it.
This candelabra is covered in these little votives that are wrapped in East African fabrics. And I bought them from this not-for-profit in Tel Aviv that gives work to East African migrants and allows them to celebrate the craft from where they came. But, and I love the way it fills the space underneath the coffee table. This is the book that everyone opens and looks at when they come into apartment. I'm like a diehard Kardashian fan. I've watched the show from the beginning and it's a compilation of all of her selfies up to this point. And some, like clockwork, whenever someone comes over who hasn't been to my apartment before, they notice it and they want to flip through it. Even if I like, bury it, like it doesn't need to be prominently on a table, it still is always a kind of topic of conversation. And this candle sits on a bird's nest that I found in the fall in my grandma's garden. And it's very special to me because she passed away two months ago. And I always think of her and her gardens, which were very important to her when I see that piece. Yeah, and there's also a kind of funny accidental Kardashian reference in this chair. Um, because I, I bought this chair, it was so ugly but I thought it had potential. It kind of reminded me of a grotto chair, but a little less glitzy and absurd, and it was super comfortable. So I bought it, I took a leap of faith. It was upholstered in this burgundy, strange, furry fabric, and I had it recovered and then it arrived. And then two months later, Kim Kardashian did a skims shoot sitting in basically the exact same chair, painted white. So that's kind of a fun chair. I, uh, like how it really balances out the chair on the other side, which is very different because um, this is a mid-century chair that I had covered in this leopard with these satin buttons. And then I added bouillon fringe too because I love using bouillon fringe on more modern silhouettes. My coffee table was another find that presented itself to me from the garbage. In my last apartment, I had the most beautiful coffee table. It was a uh, French Duoctois table, it fit the space perfectly, but it was so flimsy and uninviting that no one would put their feet on it, it constantly needed Windexing, and no one would put their glasses on it. And so this time my one requirement was I wanted a table that felt indestructible, beaten up, that no one would feel bad about putting their feet on. And this presented itself to me right outside the door of a client meeting downtown. And I ended up taking it home in an Uber immediately. And I love the scale of it and how it's kind of early American inspired, but it also looks a little bit Indian at the same time. And so it kind of fits all the bohemian touches in the apartment. And it's a great place for me to display my latest favorite art books interesting little dishes that I find, trinkets people give me. And then I have this fun chess set, which also lately, I only added that recently. I find that people who did like chess camp or chess things growing up always want to play it when they come over, which is really fun. Kind of a funky touch to the apartment. So I've always been really passionate about interior design. Even as a kid, I used to read all the shelter magazines in the aisle, Barnes and Noble, and love going to estate sales and antique stores with my parents and grandparents. So I loved material culture. And I didn't really know how to make a career out of that, honestly. In high school and in college, I did little decoration jobs on the side and I would sell art and antiques for extra money. But again, I didn't really see it as a job. I mean, I considered going the shelter magazine route and becoming an editor, but when I graduated from college, that world was kind of imploding, it felt, and it wasn't a great time. So I went into corporate America and I was a management consultant. And I was on two projects that were in the home industry that I really loved. Um, and that made me realize that I could be at this intersection of home retail and business that I really loved. And it led me to joining Schumacher, um, the iconic fabric and wallpaper house, where I worked for several years. And on the side, I was continuing to interior design. And when the pandemic hit, my business completely exploded. And I had this also reflection that this was the work I really wanted to be doing when the world was locked down. And I was so excited about waking up to decorate. And so I went down that path and 
did it for several years and that's where I am now. Right now I'm an interior designer and I'm also part of the team at Palazzo, which is an awesome startup that allows homeowners and interior designers to use AI to visualize and experiment with changes in their space. I love tableware. I am like an unapologetic hoarder of tableware. The oven's full of it. The spot above the uh, kitchen cabinets is full of it. There's stuff under the sofa, like you name it, I see it, I want it. And so I love setting the table and cooking for people. I don't get to cook enough, I'd say, just with how busy I am. But when I get the opportunity to, or even I'll even set the table if I order Chinese food just for myself. And this dining area, there wasn't a spot to put an overhead light because I already had an overhead light in the middle of the room. And so I ended up finding this extra tall old floor lamp. Uh, which was actually another garbage find, funny enough. I found the shade and the lamp a week apart in the neighborhood, in the trash. And this lamp, I was actually on the way to dinner, and I was late to that dinner when I found it. So I actually hid it behind the bush of a building on Park Avenue, off Park Avenue, hoping that it would be waiting for me when I got home from dinner. And I think I got home from that dinner around like 2 a.m. and I was thinking about it all night. And I was so happy when it was waiting for me behind that bush still. And I like how it feels like overhead lighting on the table, but this is the one spot where I always have flowers, like clockwork, always have flowers, have these plates, and I have them paired with these French wine glasses that have this polka dot pattern that kind of mimics these Mexican hand-blown ones that I love for water, and then some silver plate and this fun fish service. So really pretty. I just set the table to show you guys. Um, but, and then these votives are a recent purchase. I just bought these at H&M Home in Paris. But it's a way to get some candlelight on the table and create the mood, I think. Yeah, and then these two, I have this stack of pieces above it. I think I mentioned that I try to vary within any one project the ways that I display art. So one way is a single statement piece, as you'll see later. Another is two statement pieces paired, like artfully. The other is salon style, which you'll see in my bedroom, a grid, the way you see over my reading nook, and a more curated gallery, the way I have over my sofa. But this piece is by Claude Viola. It's a collaboration he did with Hermes Framed. Um, and I love how it carries the orange that's really all over the apartment. And then this photograph is by Doug Aitken. And it's kind of eerie, but I love it. Well, I had it in my first apartment out of college, and my friend thought it was so creepy. That was the word she used to describe it. But something about the distortion of the angle, like you can't tell, you don't realize this is a sign at first. You're kind of there's this mysterious unknown in the alley, and it almost doesn't look real. And the reflection, I love that work. It's one of my favorite things I have, I'd say, in the apartment. So uh, I was a British history major in college. So that's why I think there's a lot of English furniture here, and I have a soft spot for it. My parents also had a lot. And these dining chairs I bought from a dealer in Savannah who I've worked with for years. And they felt very Downton Abbey to me. And I just loved the acanthus leaf detail and the original linen velvet on the chairs. And they were a set of five. They are now a set of four because I had a Christmas party two years ago where someone was sitting on the chair and collapsed into it, which was quite funny, but also scary to watch. So I had all the chairs reinforced after, but if they've made it like 200 years now, I, I think that it was high time for them to finally be reinforced. I thought I think they had a pretty good run and I love them. This painting was a relatively recent purchase and I was actually on an art buying moratorium, when, which I have to do periodically. But I saw it and I just couldn't say no. It's by a Chicago artist named Yvette Mayorga. She's really popping off right now and making great strides in her career, even though she is very early. Her mom worked as a cake decorator um, at grocery stores. And so that gave her this artistic language that she wanted to apply to fine contemporary art and really celebrate the struggle of these workers who many of whom cross into the country illegally and work in service industries. 
And what she did is she went deep into the canon of art history and found vases and vessels at Versailles and recreated them in this pasty cake decoration. But she uses that language to make a lot of commentary on Gen Z and femininity and generational differences in general. So you see the Hello Kitty, you see the little car, but you also see the tears and some of the struggles. And I just love the piece. And it's such a conversation starter and a really joyful contemporary thing. And it's the first piece you see really when you walk through the door. A dog is the most important thing to bring a home to life. So if you have the opportunity to bring a beautiful English Hawker Spaniel into your life, that's the best recommendation I have to uh, make a house into a home. I would also say personal touches are really key. Um, that could be books, it could be objects from people's family. I believe those are so key to making a home not look like a showroom and not look like a store. Um, I also think it's really important to not get everything from your home in the same place and incorporate things that are vintage and antique because those add a sense of depth to a room and in the history of design we've been through so many cycles at this point that there is something vintage and antique for everyone's personal style. Another thing I would say that really brings a home to life is having natural and living things. I always try to have cut flowers, even if they're just a single arrangement from Bodega or Trader Joe's. That and a house plant adds so much to a space. I definitely am not a hardcore plant dad. I actually kill everything within a few months and just replace them, but those add a lot of life and joy to an apartment, I find, and any home. My kitchen, which is open to my living room, it works out really well because if people are over, I can cook and they can still talk to me, and I can also still watch the TV when I'm cooking. But my kitchen also functions as the entry to the apartment, so I wanted to do the best I could to spruce up the rental kitchen that I inherited from the previous tenant. So the cabinets were this hideous birch color that felt very dated, and it drove me completely insane until I had this idea to have them wrapped in this black wood, wood contact paper and then add these vintage brass poles. And I think they make the smaller kitchen feel more like a bar and less like a small kitchen. And I love how the very first thing you see when you walk in is the bar, which for most people would not be a functional place. But for me, this is honestly the perfect height to reach for my Cointreau, the things I use most. And, it's really welcoming. You know when you're gonna walk through the front door, if that's the first thing you see, you know you're gonna have a good time. So that's my bar. I use my oven somewhat. However, it does heat the place up a lot, so I'm more of a stove guy. <laughs> um, this, is, you, this bowl is from my grandma. It used to actually be in their kitchen over the stove. And when she gave it to me, I started using it for my fruit and produce. And it's really a nice green thing to see when you walk in. And you can see Cody. A friend gave me this mouse pad of Cody, and you can see him on the fridge. I try not to let the fridge become full-on mom fridge with a million things, which is why I don't let myself have many magnets and clips. But sometimes things do pile up. But you can see I used all the space above also for some of my favorite cookware and pictures and really easy to access things. Um, I love my Euro machine. I am a huge coffee drinker and I can't imagine my kitchen without it. I'm completely addicted and it is the most important thing in this whole kitchen. But this kitchen for, I guess it's small so maybe this isn't surprising, only has one drawer. And that presented this problem of where to put my silverware, which I also have a lot of because the cousin of tableware. And so I ended up storing them on the counter in these cups that are from this old Missoni collaboration with Target. And I think they're very fun. And then I also, because of the drawer issue, end up keeping all of my wooden spoons and cooking utensils inside this old glazed salt crock, which is really fun. 
herbs on the counter, very easy kitchen. And I, the apartment had boob lights throughout these flush mounts that were just terrible. So that was the first thing I changed. You see, I did the chandelier in the living room. And then here I did this crystal one that felt very fun. I liked how it was silver because that genre of fixture is usually in brass. And it reminded me a lot of the light fixtures at a hotel my family would go to a lot growing up. So that was really special. Um, when you walk into the kitchen, I have a lot of some of my little sort of sentimental things. This little picture my friend Lauren had painted for me and I just love it. It's such a happy thing to see when I walk in. That's Cody at the beach. And then this little fish is from Hawaii. So it's kind of this happy beach moment right when you walk in the front door. And I love that about it. And the other thing I'll say about the kitchen is this is the other first thing you see when you walk in besides the bar. It's a poster from a music festival in the 60s. And I discovered this, I want to say in 2015, MoMA did a recuration of their permanent collection to really focus on the 60s, where each room was a different year of the 60s. There was 60 or 61, etc. And each year also had span different media. So there was a car in the gallery, there was music posters. This poster I saw on that show, and I love Egyptian motifs, and uh, I saw this poster and I just loved it. I sort of assumed, oh, it's in a museum, like there's no way I'll be able to get this. But then I looked it up and there was one available, very reasonably priced, so I bought it immediately after. And it has my favorite color, the orange and the blue, and then the pink, which references the Yvette Mayorga and lots of the other things. I know hanging art on doors might seem a little bit crazy, but I was running out of space, and because it's the first thing you see between a bunch of command strips, it's pretty sturdy, and it's a storage closet I don't use that often, so I felt fine about it. I also put art on this door, this painting from Mexico, which also has the same color palette. Like, we keep coming back to the greens, the blues, the pinks, and the oranges, so that's definitely my palette. For hosting people, I, I don't think it's fun to be like a short order cook. I, I really don't want to cook for more than three people, but I love having people over for kind of hors d'oeuvres and cocktails, and I'll use the dining table and cover it in apps. This becomes the bar, and it's really fun. You can see recently I've been very into uh, making chicken and morels and a lot of French bistro fare, I think because I got the Barefoot in Paris cookbook and was just in Paris for in early January. So you can see I have Madeira out and sherry vinegar and olive oil for making salad dressing. Um, the other favorite thing is the butter crock, which is where I keep my butter because I love having it soft at room temperature. Um, and I am diehard. I can't imagine bread with butter, making cheese sandwiches. It's, it's great. My art is the favorite. Thing about my home. I love that I get to live with it and enjoy it and display it in so many different ways, from arrays to group together to salon style to individual standalone pieces. There's a lot of wall space for a small apartment. Another favorite thing about my apartment is all of the textiles and the mix of different colors and patterns throughout the apartment. One thing about the like world of pattern that I love is how much range there is. And I try to celebrate all of it and all of the different ways of making textiles. I have block prints in here. I have silk ecots. I have killums. I have embroideries. I have stripes. I have a zebra hide. And I love that about the apartment because it gives it so much depth. And some of them are pieces um, from my grandma that I or uh, gifts from friends, and those are even more special because they have a personal touch and a different, in addition to being beautiful and remind me of those people. Right off the kitchen, I have my bathroom, and this was another rental renovation from the landlord that I had to kind of deal with and make the most of. So what I did to break up the sea of white was add in this removable grass cloth paper. I swapped out the light fixture with this fun mid-century one from Belgium, put in one of my glasses, this great block print shower curtain from West Elms collab with Rode. I keep my soap on another, an antique plate that I got on Nantucket. I put this French pastel that I just love. And then this needlepoint that my grandma did 
out of a kit. And it's actually special because she usually didn't finish handicraft projects. She would start them but not finish them. So this is one of the few ones she actually finished. And I think it's very happy and it fits the color palette. And then on the floor, I added this rug from Greece that was the first thing I put down. I think I generally like to do Oriental or Caucasian rugs on the floors of bathrooms. Not super valuable or special ones because there's going to be a lot of moisture, but I think it adds a lot of depth. And I also swapped out the toilet seat for a wood one just to add a little warmth and old timey charm to the room. And then this folk art portrait that you see reflected in the mirror is really charming. It's a little creepy, but I love the oranges she's holding and her facial expression and the blue frame. Let's head to my bedroom next. Follow me. Welcome to my bedroom. Full of some of my favorite things. It's very cozy. Gets amazing light in the morning. My bed is a four poster bed, which I think is so cozy and welcoming. I love to do four poster and canopy beds whenever I can. And I'm definitely obsessed with bed linens. It's kind of a cousin of being obsessed with tableware, I'd say. So I always, every week, am excited to pick the mix of bed linens that all go on my bed. And a lot of them are antiques. So these open cut work embroidered ones are from France, um, from the 19th century. And they're mixed with Matouk and Yves Delorme shams, this pretty blanket from Pendleton, and then this old Suzani. And I think Suzani's are so graphic. And this beige one doesn't compete with the gallery wall, but it really finishes off the room and makes the bed less of a sea of white in the middle of the room. And these pillows um, are from a collaboration Etro, the fashion brand, did with Clarence House. And I like how they're kind of a pair. They don't fully match, and they have animals on them, which I love. This is my favorite animal, but I also love monkeys and toucans, and I think they're really special. My bedside tables were actually, I had very limited space, but it was important to me to have a pair of bedside tables. And so I ended up finding these at West Elm that were just the right size. And I replaced the hardware with these kind of chinoiserie ones from Etsy. I think they really changed it. And so I keep a box to keep my medicine in, usually have a book, a dish, and a plant to add some greenery. But the most important things in this bedroom are, let's see, the bed and the gallery wall. It's such a nice thing to wake up to and also go to bed to. You see some of my favorite pieces um, that are really sentimental and things that I've just found, and they all get a place of honor. Um, I love this photo of Jackie Kennedy and Lee Radziwill because my grandma actually met Jackie Kennedy on that trip. So, and that's in her hometown. So that feels very special. Um, this Slim Aarons was, is Sea Drive, which has been my favorite Slim Aarons forever. And I only found out a few years ago that this woman is a really close family friend because I'd never seen a label. And when my mom told her, like, that's his laptop screensaver, that's his favorite image, she actually sent me one of the photos for my birthday that year from the original run. So it's really a special piece, and I like this one of the first one I see when I walk in. This is just a map of the New York City subway that this artist in front of the Guggenheim makes into these faces, and I think it's just so great. I love street art here. This was another street find I bought from someone outside the Whole Foods. Yeah, and then there's a lot of homages to Cocker Spaniels throughout the apartment. So you saw the little Cocker Spaniel figurine. Another one is Carolina Herrera, who's a big style icon of mine, with her childhood Cocker Spaniel. And Carolina uh, walks the reservoir um, every day. And Cody and I ran into her. and. and uh, she pet him, and it was very special. This piece with the snake um, I found at a flea market in Bangkok, and I actually was taped to the back of a bookshelf of a rare books dealer. And there was something about it just really sucked me in, and I wanted to have it. And so I found a cool frame for it, and it's kind of funny having it next to this other snake that my friend Allegra gave me. I try to have like little connections between photos I put next to each other. Like 
that's why like you see like the Carolina photo, the Slamerans, the Jackie, those all, they're kind of a genre together. The snake is next to a snake. There might be color. Like this painting used to be in my parents' library. And it was always one of my favorites. It has that rusty orange and the red and kind of reminds me of the gates in Cinderella, but I just love it and the silver frame. This portrait I found on Cherish and I thought it was very ambiguous. Like she, there was something sort of robotic about her, but then there was also something kind of folksy about her and kind of ethnographic and the color palette was just right. I love textiles. This is by, I have two pieces, this by her, by this textile artist um, based in Inwood. Um, this is from a sample of some work she did with Peter Marino for the Chanel store. And then this is just one of her awesome embroidered works. I think her work is so fantastical and like dramatic and it mixes up the other pieces. The dresser is an English serpentine dresser. It kind of fits with all of the other English furniture in the room. Uh, I think the serpentine breaks up some of the boxiness of this room because it is very rectangular and then there's a bed. And I like this modern sculpture, how it kind of offsets that. And then the print on this lamp references all the other textiles in the room. And this mannequin, I love to put hats on. Like for a point this summer, he had the kippah from my best friend's wedding. And I got him on Cherish probably 10 or 12 years ago now. And I put, right now he's wearing this hat that I bought off of a motorcyclist in Vietnam. I usually you see like hats there that are made of this material in like the typical cone shape. But something about this one being a baseball cap really stood out and it doesn't like fit me. Like it, it just doesn't. It's not the right shape of my head, doesn't look good, but it does work on him, which is great. So now he gets to wear it. And um, this tree basically gets replaced every five months when I kill the other one. But I like having something green to fill this corner. This Milo Bauman chair has always been one of my favorite designs, but it didn't, it's never been able to work for spaces that I've needed. And then in this apartment, I finally found one that, I finally found a spot for it, I should say. And so I like how it takes this very traditional English Chippendale design, like some of the English furniture that I have, and reinterprets it in a modern way that's mass producible with the chrome. And then I keep this Dransfield and Ross indigo pillow on it to soften it. Kind of a garbage can, just kind of making a little vignette, a place to throw things and finish out the bedroom. And this uh, Picasso poster behind it is so great. It's from a show he did in the late 50s, and I think the figures are so crisp, and I like the typeface on it a lot. And the Burltwood frame, which Milo Bauman used a lot, felt very right to be next to it. The last thing in this room I'll show you is above my nightstand, I have these Otago Kunisadas, who was a really prolific Japanese illustrator. And I, after I bought these and hung them up, I found out he's actually a distant relative of one of my favorite clients. And so that was a very small world thing to realize. And I have six, so I have three on each side of the bed. Well, you know you have an art problem when you're hanging art behind doors that are closed 95% of the time. But this piece was a gift uh, from a friend. And she found it at a Goodwill in rural Florida and it was has this fascinating story it was from a gallery in Cairo it still has the markings in the 1960s and there's something really great about the water and the lines and the curves and I love the uh, the draping and how exaggerated it is almost the way you see in El Greco paintings and the architecture and the landscape the color it really filled this spot perfectly. This room has so much going on, I wouldn't have wanted to continue the gallery wall onto the side. And on the floor, I just have a Tuareg mat, which um, are used by like Bedouin tribes in Morocco and uh, Mauritania to cover tents, really. And 
I think they're really great. This one I bought from Dara Capanegro, um, who worked with me at Schumacher and is their creative director. And is, so it's um, sentimental in that way because she's someone I look up to a lot. To me, home is a place that you're excited to share with the people you care about. And it's about being welcoming and really expressing your personality and telling you your story in 3D form. Thanks for watching. Go to homeworthy.com for exclusive content and shopping guides.